Let us bow our head just a moment for prayer. O oh God, we thank Thee tonight for this fine fellowship that we've had in this past week around Thy Word with Thy people. And we would ask Thee, our God, to bless these who have attended this meeting and supported it in every way. And may this little flower of salvation never die in these people. May it just keep blooming until there is an old-fashioned revival that just sweeps throughout the nation. Grant it, Father. We commit all these things to Thee now, doing all that we believe that's the best that we could do, and leaving the rest up to You. Give us the exceeding abundance tonight, Father. May there not be one feeble person in our midst when the service is closed, neither spiritually or physically. And all praise shall be thine, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. That's right. That's all right. I'm just a little bit hoarse, so I was getting this little fellow closer to me here. I don't know when I've enjoyed a fellowship with people as I have this past week in your city. This has been just a real jubilee for me. I'm sorry I had to come to you tired. But I'm just about that way all the time because I'm on the move all the time and we're leaving out tomorrow for a concord, I believe it is, New Hampshire, for two nights. This was a long stay and we're grateful for it to you for all that you have done. To the World Harvest, who is our sponsors, we certainly thank them for to bring us here and to you ministers who have cooperated and to the laity and you people who have given us the offerings and things that paid the expense and Brother Vail just told me that there was a kind of an offering taken up now for missions and myself that I thank you with all my heart for the best of God's knowledge my knowledge that God will give me I will do the best that I can to see that it goes to the kingdom of God and now if any time I can be a blessing to you or help in any way, you just let me know. Write to me, this post office box 325 at Jeffersonville, Indiana, or if you can't think of the post office box, just write to Jeffersonville, Indiana, and it'll come to me. And if I can send you an anointing cloth, pray for you, and or anything that I can do to help you, make life a little better for you, I'm your brother in Christ. And then... I am trusting to the Lord that someday, if it be pleasing to God and the will of the people, that we'll get to return back again to you because we certainly enjoy this day being here. And Dr. Vail and myself and Mr. Sweet and Billy Paul, Leo and Jean, and the Tate boys and Brother Stockman and his son, we all want to thank you for your kindness, your fellowship. I've never seen it any better in the world. And I thought when I went come to New England that it would be a very starchy, indifferent group of uh, self-styled, uh, conservative people, but I have found out that that's wrong. Being a Southerner, uh, they've always kind of had a little feeling about the South. Of course, you all know we won the war. <laughs> There's no more Yankees left, just one southern. <laughs> I told somebody that in the restaurant here that he didn't stop and looked at me. To think of that, probably. Did you see what the southerner said to the Yankee when he was dying? Sent him a telegram and said, God bless you, Yankee. I hope to see you again. Why couldn't that have been in the first place? It's too bad we have to have him. But I've been treated real nice, and they talk about southern hospitality. You have to come north to find it. Right. 
really mean it. Very nice. So, God bless you is the best thing that I can say. And I'm sure if he'll do that, we'll all meet again in some way. Maybe it's not in this life, we will in the life that is to come. That's one we look forward to. And this week, the last few nights especially, I've kind of had a bad voice. I told you I'd like to have preached on some subjects like eagles turning its nest and so forth, but I just haven't had the voice to do it. I've been kind of blunt on some of the things that I've said, but out of the scripture, trying to lay a foundation that on that foundation, if you receive it, New England can have a revival that will sweep not New England but the world. Because we're all hungry for the bread of life. Back to the old ways again. Back to the old fashioned gospel. And let's keep it moving. There's enough people in here tonight who will take that up on their heart. I tell you, you'll be making headlines in the newspaper a week from now throughout all New England. It can be done if you just let God fill your heart and your soul and life. The rest of it will take place. He'll guide you from then on. And now, tonight, this, we're coming close to the end of our little uh, New England journey. We've got about eight more nights through the New England states here and end up at New York, at Manhattan Center. And then on, uh, I believe it's the 1st of July, we'll be over in Philadelphia at the International Convention of the Full Gospel Businessman. I don't know just where it's convention hall, I believe. There is where it will be. And um, that's the uh, Full Gospel Christian Businessmen International Convention. There'll be people there from all over the world. I'm one of their speakers at that time. So we'd be glad to have any of you there. If you're around, we won't be having healing services, just speaking. I'd like to have a chance then to shake your hand and renew our acquaintance. And now, tonight, I wish to turn into the scriptures here. I better get this thing back. I'm, I'm sure it's, you can hear me anyhow. You can hear all right? Back in the back, can you hear all right up in the back? Can you raise your hands if you can? Just raise. Well, that's fine. <clears throat> There's nothing like the, the Word of God. I just love to read it because I know that you can rest upon what you read. And now... Gypsy Smith once said when he was about down to the end of his journey, someone asked him, said, Mr. Smith, what was the most thrilling thing that, that you can remember in your ministry? He said it was an offering. And they looked at him kind of strange. He said they were taking up an offering for me one night. And when I come in the back door, said there was a, a little girl standing there with a a little piece of paper in her hand, real ragged and poor. And she said, Here, Mr. Smith, uh, they were putting your offering in up there in the plate. She said, But I'm afraid you wouldn't have accepted mine, so I thought I would just hand it to you here, Mr. Smith. Said, My father has been saved and my mother has been saved in your meeting, and I want to give you my offering. It's all I have. Said, He said, Bless your heart, honey. Pat her on the head and went on. And you'll never guess what it was. A little lollipop wrapped up in a piece of paper. So that struck him about as hard as anything. And then last night when I was coming up the steps, I thought of that. There's a typical little New England girl about six years old or seven standing down there. It's a Coke machine. Now, I love little children. I've got a little old boy at home, little Joseph, and them as soon as they get in my... Oh, we had to give him a piggyback, you know, and bounce him around, and we go hunting, you know, and so. And there's a little girl standing there. I said, I thought of speaking to the folks coming up. She looked around. She got little, what did she call the hair twisted over? Pony tape. <laughs> and um, my little girl's having too. So then uh, I said, How do you do, honey? And she said, Say, Brother Brandon, I like you. <laughs> I thought of that several times through the night when I woke up last night. That just meant something to me, that little child saying that. I like you, Brother Brandon. I remember that. I said, honey, that's mutual. I like you too. 
Doesn't little children just get next to you? I remember in Finland, after the resurrection of that little boy, I had a bunch of that money. It's just kind of, oh, I guess you'd have to have a pile that big to make a quarter. And so it was no good to us. So I'd wait till all the manager and all of them have them all down to the place speaking, you know. I'd get out on the street and get this money. And people would give it to me, put it in my pockets going out, you know. And I'd get all the candy I could. And I'd have a string of kids to the city block line. All the little fellows. I remember that little boy who had been raised up. You've read it in the book. And so they went all over the country. And that night coming in, I was all two or three city blocks before we could get even to the mess of Holly where we were having 25,000 there and they let me speak to them and make them go out another 25,000 come in like that. So coming down the street, little Finnish soldiers, little young kiddies never shaved. They're just smooth-faced little boys. And long overcoats, great big boots, and they were going along. They were guarding, coming down to keep the people from the side. And I've seen something take place there. Russian soldiers standing there at that Russian sloop. Tears run down their cheeks. They said, we'll receive a God like that that has power to raise the dead. What caused communism? The church let down. Right. We'll receive a God like that. And I've seen Russian soldiers put their arms around the fin and hug them and pat them on the back. Anything that will make a Russian pat a fin or a fin pat a Russian will settle war. <laughs> Christ is the answer every time. Amen. I went in, the five or six little soldiers around me, their little knives out. To, we started in a little place and went up the steps so I could come in. And they were then saying only believe in their own language. And over in the ladies' dormitory, a little girl stepped out of there. She was the most pitiful-looking sight I ever seen. Her little ragged hair and her little skirts all ragged. And she had a she was an afflicted child. She had a a brace around her hair. Pictures in the book. The details of it isn't there, but just the picture and a little of the detail. She had a big brace around her this way, and one leg was about all three or four inches short in the other, and she had no use of that limb at all. It swung free. And she had braces that braced up each side and a big shoe, and in the end of that shoe she had a snap and a strap that went over her shoulder, hooked back in the back of her belt behind her, two crutches. And the way she'd walk, this strap being kind of uh, tight, she'd set her little crutches out, and raise her little shoulder, pick up that bad leg and set it out on those braces and then she can make her walk. When it, she's just about as far as that wall when I'm coming in. And when she seen that it was, it, it was me, what she, she stopped. She didn't know what, they had told her, don't bother me when I was coming in, you know. I, that's almost heartless, but you'd have a, <laughs> you'd, you'd suffocate and pile it on you. And so I, Looked at that little thing. I knew that child wanted to come over there. And uh, the soldier behind me motioned on. I couldn't speak one word. <laughs> so I just told him, just a minute. And the other two or three turned around. Just a minute. I looked at the little girl and I said, you want to come over here, honey? Of course, she didn't understand what I said. And then I motioned to her like this. And here she comes. She put her little crutches out, raised up her little leg, stepped over she come over. I just stood to watch see what that kid would do. And she come right up close to me, stopped, held her little crutches down. She reached down and got a hold of the, my pocket, pulled it up to her little lips and kissed her. Dropped the coat down. There's a little Finnish girl, always very bright. She pulled her little crutches. She pulled her little skirt out. Said, keep us. Keep us means thank you. Keep us. I looked over and my little lips are quivering, little pale looking cheeks, and the tears running out of her little cheeks. I found out there she's a little war artist. Her father and mother had been killed by the Russians in the war, and she was living in a tent. <coughs> this affair that they'd made up for, she didn't have any father and mother. I believe I'd have been the biggest hypocrite in the world. God would have honored that child's faith. I couldn't talk to her. I just kind of. Wiped a little tear from my eye and started 
And I see her standing in front of me in a vision with no braces on, just as well. I thought, how can I make her understand? I said, we are Jesus, he healed you. She kept it. He just, she thought I was getting after her, started going back like that. I thought, well, bless her little heart, she'll find out sometime. I went on in about the end of the service, and my, my brother then, Billy was too little to be with me. Mr. Baxter and them were standing there. They thought I had just about enough. They were leaving them. They were going to make me leave the platform. And I said, oh, well, just call five by five more and let them come up. So they had to get the interpreter who would give out the prayer cards, and we couldn't speak the Finnish language, and somebody there had to give the cards out. And by God's grace, she was next one on. I said to Mrs. Einstein, who used to meet me in New York, she's there tonight, my interpreter, American born, Finnish speaking woman, and I said, Sister Einstein, just say as I'm saying. I said, Bless your little heart, honey. You're the little girl that was out there just a few minutes. Jesus has made you well. You go over here and come up and take those braces off. Hold your little hands on your hips. And as the brace comes off, just slide your little hand down your leg and come back and show me. And the next was a woman. They brought her up. All of a sudden, I heard her scream. And here she came with those braces over her shoulder. Screaming to the top of the voice, running up and down some steps and running that way. Just as hard as she could go. Them little eyes all brightened up. I tell you, that made me try to swim the ocean to see God in something like that for a second. Something about the little fellow with the tender. I really love him. I may never see her again in life, but I guess I will on the other side. Now, we're going to open the Word. Now, I'm going to speak tonight from the Laodicean Church Age, which I'm sure that all of us tonight know that we are living in the Laodicean church age. Do you believe that? That was the last church age, and this is the message to the Laodicean church age. It had been so hard on the morals of the people in the country and the way the church was let down, I thought maybe I'd speak from this tonight. Before we open the book, let's speak to the author first with our heads down. Father, we are now just about to open this word Lay back the pages and read out of here for context. We would ask you to be merciful and to interpret the word to us. For we know that there is no man that's able, as we saw in the scriptures, no man could open the book or to loose the seals thereof. No man in heaven, in earth, beneath the earth. But the Lamb came and taken the book. And he opened it and took the seals and opened the seals and revealed it. Oh, Lamb of God, come tonight and reveal thy word to us and open it up that our understanding might be perfect. Lord God, I'm insufficient to speak to this lovely group of people, not saying this that they'd hear me, for that would be hypocrites. But Thou knowest, Lord, and I pray that you will give me something to say at this time that might start the revival to really going. Granted, Lord, may the sick be healed, the deaf and dumb speak and hear, the blind see, the cripples walk. May they see and understand that Jesus is present. And when we leave tonight, may we say like those who came from Emmaus, did not our hearts burn with him as he talked to us along the way? For we ask it in his name and for his glory. Amen. In the book of Revelation, the third chapter and the twentieth verse, I want to read this one verse. Many of you will read, has read the entire book. I wish you would read this third chapter anyhow when you go home tonight. But the 20th verse reads this, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. That's just a little portion of this great message to the Laodicean church. 
But you see, there's enough there. If God will just open that up to us, then we will have sufficient. It's His Word. And there's many times, like in the message, sometimes we could preach hours, and sometimes just ten minutes. It depends on what part of the Word that God opens to us. It's the little things that we leave undone trying to do the big things. And a chain is only at its, its best at its weakest link. Remember, no matter how great the other links are, it'll never hold them more than its weakest link. And the church is the same. No stronger than its weakest member. And we try to think if we could get great crowds of people, or great powerful speakers, or have something great to be done, or attract the attention of the great people. But you see, God don't always look at what we call great. God sees the little things too. Up in our neighboring nation, Canada, some time ago, my good friend, Brother Baxter, from Vancouver, we were up there at the visit of King George. That was before he had been healed with a multiple sclerosis and his ulcerated stomach. I certainly had a respect for the man. And when he came down to the street that day, yet suffering, they said, intense pain from both his sclerosis and his ulcer, he sat straight, uh, bowing to his subjects as he passed along the street. And I noticed my friend, when the king passed by, he just chuckled out and wept. He said, Brother Branham, think there's the king, and look at the queen in her beautiful gown. And I thought that that would make a Canadian feel that good, in which I respect and think that's fine. And if he could feel that way as a Canadian when the king George and the Queen pass by, what will it be when we see Jesus, our King, go by? <laughs> the schools all turned out, and the teachers gave the little children some little British flags to wave at the King as he passed by. And after the King had made his way down the street in his carriage, well, all the children were supposed to turn back to school. And one little girl was missing. So the teacher rushed out in the streets to see where the child had went in the great multitude of people. And they found her standing behind the telegraph pole, weeping her little heart out. And the teacher picked her up and hugged her in her arms. And he, she said, Honey, what's wrong? Said, did you not get to see the king pass by? Said, yes, I saw him. Did you wave your flag? Said, yes, I waved my flag. Did you scream and uh, praises to him as he passed? Yes, I did that. Said, and you got to see the king? Yes. But said, well, what you weeping about? She said, Teacher, I saw the king, but I was too little for the king to see me. He didn't see me, and I was waving my flag, but I was too little. That might have been true, but it's not so with God. No matter how little you are and how insignificant you may seem to be, God sees every little worship that you do for him. Every little thing, he's right there to look at it and to bless you just the same as the big person. Now we have an unusual subject tonight, and God is unusual, and he does unusual things. Not in his own way, 
But in our way of thinking, it's unusual. And I forget the artist named at this time who painted this famous picture of Jesus knocking at the door. And however, when a picture is painted before it becomes famous, it has to go through what's called the Hall of Critics first. However, it cost this man his life, always like to fix this picture like the Last Supper did. And after a picture has gone through the Hall of Critics, then it can be hung in the Hall of Fame. What a type that is of the church. Before it can ever be taken in the rapture to the hall of fame in God's kingdom, it has to pass through the critics to see if it can stand the test. Think it not strange when fiery trials come upon you. It's all done to test your faith. And all that lives godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. No exception. All. God has no exceptions in that. All people must have their child training. And when this great picture was going to the critics, there was one outstanding critic who came up to this certain writer, and he said to him, Sir, I think your portrait of Christ is wonderful. I think that the door and the building is wonderful. And the expression of the expectation to hear an answer from the inside. I think it's all wonderful. But there's just one thing that you left out. And the artist said, Kind sir, what is it that I have left out of my picture? He said, there is no latch on the door. Oh, the artist said, I painted it thus. He said, well, how could he get in no matter how much he was knocking if there was no latch on the door? He said, sir, in this case, the latch is on the inside. The one that's on the inside has to open. He cannot open from the outside. He cannot save you against your will. He cannot heal you against your will. He cannot send a revival against your will. You've got to be willing and open the door and invite him in. Why would a person knock on another door? Oh, what a picture. And here he says, I stand and knock at the door. Well, he's trying to gain entrance. There's something that someone knocking at your door, a friend or whatever it may be, they're trying to gain entrance into your presence so that they can talk to you or give you something or ask something of you. Many great men down through the ages is not at door. For instance, what do you think that would took place if the great Caesar of his day would have come down to a peasant's door and knocked on the door? And that peasant would have went to the door and seen the great mighty Caesar standing there. He would have threw the door open and fell on his face and said, Sir, enter into my home. If there is anything that you wish in my home or wish of me, gladly shall you receive it. You have honored me, sir, great emperor of Rome, to come to my door, for I am a poor man. And you give me honor to stand on my step. Or what if the, in Germany, a few years ago, if the late Adolf Hitler would have come down to one of the foot soldiers of Germany and knocked at his door. 
And the soldier would have went to the door and opened the door and there stood the mighty fear of Germany. That little soldier would have come to attention and with the German salute and with joy in his heart and tears running down his cheeks, he'd said, great fear of Germany. You have honored me, sir, the greatest man in Germany. Come into my house. And if there's anything here that you want, it's yours. What could I do for our great fear of Germany? You see, it depends on the importance of the person that's at your door. You know, tonight, if uh, it would be an honor to the best Democrat in this city for President Dwight Eisenhower to come knock on your door, though you would disagree with him in politics, yet Mr. Eisenhower is one of the greatest men in authority in the United States of America. And how would you feel, though you disagreed with him, to know that the President of this United States stood knocking at your door? You'd feel honored because he is the President. Or just recently the Queen of England visited Canada and she came to the United States. And when she was here in the United States, what if she come here to Bangor, Maine and went down to the poorest woman that there is in this city and the humblest home there is and would have knocked at the door? Not only that, but the greatest home in the city or any home. You would have been honored with that queen come and knock and though you're not her subject. But you have to know she's the greatest queen in all the earth. This queen in England now. And you'd been honored. And if you'd have went to the door and she'd said, I am the queen of England. I've come to visit you. You'd have said, great queen, come into my home. Anything. And she would have asked, you might have had a little trinket that you thought lots of. But if that queen would have asked you for that, you'd have gladly given it to her because it would have been an honor to give that to a queen, the greatest queen in the world. And if she would have done that, every radio in America or in the world would have passed the message. Every television, every newspaper would have said the great queen of England came over in America and humbled herself to come down to a poor peasant's home and visit with such and such a person. She's so important. But who's any more important than Jesus? And who's any more turned away than Jesus? Jesus will come and knock at the heart's door trying to gain entrance to give you eternal life. And he's turned away as a fanatic. And if you would accept him, you got any right up it would be called some kind of slander, a bunch of fanatics. You never heard such in your life. That goes to show that the world still has its conceptions of Christ. What it said at Calvary, give us Barabbas and you crucify Jesus. It's still in their heart. And Jesus wants to enter in to bless you. The queen might have taken something from you. But, and Mr. Eisenhower might be asking you to change your politics. But Jesus just wants to come in and bless you. And you turn him away. Don't want him. 
He's turned down, been turned down from more doors than all the rest of great men in all the world. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the King of heaven, the only mediator between God and man, the greatest of all great, from the highest of heaven to the lowest in the world, the pits of hell, come down to save Adam's race and gave his life freely as a ransom and Please, and men and women turn him away every night. Too selfish. You're afraid it'll hurt your prestige. Afraid there's somebody will talk about you. Somebody say that you're what you're a religious fanatic. No, he is always talked about when he was here on earth, and he's still tonight. If they call the master of the house of the Elzebub. How much more will they call them of his subjects? And how that he longs to get into your heart. Well, you'd say to me just a minute, Mr. Branham. I want you to understand my case. And I want to give it to you. I let Jesus in a long time ago. And Jesus came into my heart many years ago. Well, I'm, I'm thankful for that. And I'm just as happy, no matter what denomination of church you belong to, Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterian, Catholic, whatever you might be, I'd be just as happy as if you did it right here. I'm glad that you did that. And I thank God for you doing it. But what did you let him in for? just to save you from the fires of hell? Or did you let him in to be your Lord? Now, if you just let him in to be saved from future punishment, he isn't your Lord yet. Lord means ownership, rulership. When you let him in, you must let him have the right away when he comes in. Now, in the human heart, there's little doors inside that first door. Lots of little doors. And let's look at some of those little doors for a few minutes. The first little door after Jesus gets in, what would you think if I knocked at your door and you come down there and said, Welcome in, Mr. Brandon. I said, Thank you. I'd take off my hat and walk into your house. And if you said, Now, Mr. Branham, uh, I'll let you in the door, but... You just stay right here. Don't you go any farther than right here. Don't want you to be around in my house. I wouldn't feel very welcome. And when you just let Jesus in so you can join the church and have a, get in a little better society, Jesus is not welcome in that type of a heart. He certainly isn't. If you let me in your house, if I welcomed you in my house, I'd say, welcome in. If I brought you in, go ahead and do what you want to. You're my house. I wouldn't bring you in if I didn't have confidence in you. And if you brought me in your house, I was hungry, I'd go to the icebox and slice me off a piece of bologna and get me some bread and a piece of onion and go sit down and make me a sandwich. If I got tired, slip off my shoes, lay across the bed and sleep a while. Certainly, I'd feel like if you welcomed me in, I was your friend. And I had right anywhere in your house if you thought enough of me to welcome me in. Certainly. But when we let Jesus in, we say, Christ, don't let me go to hell, but don't you go to meddling around in my little doors in here. Let's look in some of these doors. Just as you step into the human heart, you turn to the right-hand side, and there's a little door in every human being called his private life. You don't want nobody fooling with that. Not even Jesus. Now, I'll join your church, Lord, and I'll be a good member. I'll pay my 10% or the pledges of the church. I'll go to Sunday school every Sunday morning if the pastor doesn't preach for 20 minutes. And I'll do all these things 
But don't go to tampering around in my private life. Now, isn't that modern Christianity? Why? It's the lady of sin church age. He isn't Lord. He isn't ruler in the modern Christian's heart. No, sir. Now, if you're going to speak against card games, now, we belong to a little card-playing society, me and Miss Jones and, and Miss John Doe and all of us, and now, if you're going to tamper in our society, stay out. That's right. Now, we take a little friendly drink, and we don't think there's anything to that. And now, I know I oughtn't to do this, uh, but don't get into my private life. Now, do you think he'd be welcome in a heart like that? Certainly not. Then there is another little door. Just, just to, right around the corner is another little door, and that's the door of selfishness. I'll let you in, Lord. I'll join your church, and then just to see what I can get out of it. And sometimes that gets into preaching. And you know, they say, uh, sure, I'll be a minister if everybody pat me on the back and say, you're a good fellow. If everybody patted me on the back and said I was a good fellow, I'd get to the altar just as quick as I could. I know there'd be something wrong. Because the Bible said, War unto you and all men speak well of you. The world knows its own. The world will hate you. But God will love you. And this little selfish. And oh, how long we could dwell on that. Selfishness. Then there's another little door right next door to that called pride. Now, I tell you, Lord, don't you tell me just what I'm to put on or what I'm to take off. You stay out of that room. Ah, you mind your business, I'll mind mine. Oh, I wouldn't say that, but your actions prove you do. I've got an old southern mammy that tells me that action speaks louder than words. <laughs> Your actions are so strong we can't hear your testimony. And when you take people that act indifferent, now don't you tell me, preacher, what I'm to do. I don't care what the Bible says. I know what I think in my own head. That's right. You're not thinking in your heart any longer. I know what to do. And I don't need your advice and I don't want you to read any of your holy roller stuff to me. See? And yet say, I'm, let Jesus in. And there's another little door, just around the other corner, called faith. Now look, Jesus, you can come in the door, but that's as much faith as I need. God's trying his best to get into that door of your faith and open up your heart so you can believe you say, well, I left Jesus in a long time ago, but the days of miracles is past. That shows he's not Lord yet in your heart. I believe that they had a baptism of the Holy Spirit at the day of Pentecost, but I don't believe it for today. That shows he hasn't got in yet. When you open that little door of faith and say, Lord God, I don't care what anybody says, I want you to walk in and confirm this word to me. Then he's welcome. Then you won't have to jump from place to place and have oil robbers to lay hands on you and, and another to do this and do that. You'll just take God at his word and move on when he can stand in the door of your faith. What church is he talking to? The lady you'll see in this church. Just let him at the door. I stand at the door and knock. I'm trying to get in. He wants to open up fields that you know nothing of yet. He wants to show you sights and signs and wonders that you have never dreamed of yet. Oh, if he can only get in the door of this little group of people here tonight. If he could get in the door and stand in the door of faith, I'd tell you there would be a revival while they it would sweep through New England late in the morning. If he could only get the door. There wouldn't be, this gentleman wouldn't be in the wheelchair. That lady wouldn't be sitting there. You bet there was cancer, heart trouble, crippled, blind. It would just 
happen immediately if Christ could get in the door and say, This is my word in my spirit. I stand and knock, trying to get in. What do we do? Let the world keep him away. Our theology, our membership, a lot of stuff our churches teach us that those things are gone. Well, your church just hasn't opened up the door of faith yet. The Bible said he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's what he wants to declare to you. And then as he gets into that part, there's just another door I'd like to speak to you about. That's the door of your eyes. Your man can be blind and not know it spiritually. Then, if I'm an unbeliever, don't be blind. I said, you're already blind. He said, well, smite me blind. Like Paul did. I said, I'm going to say to you the same thing as my Lord said to your daddy, get me behind me, Satan. See? And he said, I want to ask you something. If you smite me blind, I said, sir, you are blind now. Try to see as good as you can. I said, I beg your pardon. <laughs> you can't. I said, you're blind, seriously blind, which is ten million times worse than physical blind. If I have to go either blind, God let me not see daylight no more. To be blind to Christ and the Scripture. Because I'll have eyes anyhow. Like the blind prophet it was in the temple. Anna, come by the Holy Ghost and come to the Christ child, led blind through that place of all those people and stood and prophesied over Jesus. Went singing and led by the Holy Ghost out into the temple. Sons and daughters of God are led by the Spirit of God. How about Gehazi? And Elisha, when there was that dolphin, and the Syrian army had found out that they thought he was at dolphin, and that night they encamped about the city, and when the servant woke up the next morning, Gehazi, he looked out there and saw all the Syrian army, and he said, oh, my father, he said, the Syrians are all around us. He said, but there's more with us than there is with them. That old prophet stood there just as stern and cool. There is more with us than with them. And uh, Gehazi looked around and said, I don't see anyone. And God said, Lord, or Elijah said, Lord, open this boy's eyes that he might see. And when his true sight came to him, there was chariots of fire all around that old prophet and the mountains was on fire and chariots of fire. And he walked out of the city right to the chief captain and smote him blind. And the whole army blind. The Bible said they were blind. And when he said, who are you looking for, Elisha? said, yes, sir, we're looking for him. He said, come and I'll show you where he's at. And it was Elijah talking to them. That's the bad blindness. He said, come here, I'll show you where he's at. Come follow me. And Elisha led the whole Syrian army, looking at every tree, looking at everybody, looking at Elisha, yet blind. Blessed be the name of the Lord. God open our eyes. Blind and don't know it. And he went right down into the monks of the Israelites where they were laying for ambush. And then he turned around to them and their eyes were open and seen that it was Elisha. Blind, looked at everything, 20-20 hour sight, and yet didn't realize that that was Elisha. Did not Jesus have two of his disciples blinded all day until he got on the inside and performed a miracle just like he did before his crucifixion and their eyes were open? Oh, if God could only get into our eyes and let us see his presence and his glory and the manifestation of his spirit. But we're blind. No doubt that people, if our eyes would come open in this gathering like here tonight, Christ is here. 
He promised he'd be where two or three had gathered together. And now notice, blind that little door to your eyes. But you know, the Bible said to this church, he said, because you say I am rich and I am increasing good. Is that the condition of the church today? Richest it ever was. I'm increased in good. And I have need of nothing. We got the best pastors. We got the best scholars. We got the best education we ever had. We got the best buildings we ever had. We got the best theologians we ever had. More sin than we ever had. He said, because you say that you are rich and increased in good, and you don't know, listen, I'm quoting the scripture, three verses behind where I read the text, that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, and don't know. The Holy Spirit said that would be the condition of this church in this day. How are you going to get around it? Naked, miserable, poor, when you say I'm rich, poor, oh mercy, the church is anemic, it's the poorest it's ever been, miserable, with self-righteous rags on of some denomination, poor, miserable, wretched, naked, and blind, now what's the next quotation? And don't know it. I'm reading this from the Scripture. Saying that this church age in this day would be in that condition. Blind and don't know it. Now if a man was on the street, a poor man, and he was naked, cold, miserable, wretched, blind, if he knew it, he'd help himself. But if you talk about a pathetic case when a man's in that condition and don't know it, and don't accept help, why well, is such a man coming down the street and the policeman of the city would come out, someone would call the policeman and they'd say, Sir, uh, you, 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 we've got to take you in. Get your coat off of me. Well, we, we'll take you in. We, we're not going to harm you. We're trying to help you. We're officers of the city. We have a charity here. We can take care of you and feed you. And you look so thin and, and your body's exposed and, and you're in such a condition. I know what I'm saying. It. Get away from me. Couldn't do very much for a fellow like that, could you? And that's the way the church is. Thus saith the Lord. Naked. But what does the church say? The church said, I'm rich, increased in good. I have need of nothing. There is the church thinks it. You see that insanity, spiritually speaking, of the church? What would a policeman, what could a, a man run out, not even an officer, a man of the house, say, come in, sir, I'll take you to my home, you'll be my brother. I'll give you something to eat. I'll give you clothes. He said, get away from me. What are you going to do with a person like that? Well, what's a man going to do that's preaching the full gospel according to the way it's wrote in the Bible and people won't receive it? But you got to preach it anyhow. God said, do it. And don't know it. Blind. And don't know it. That's a miserable thought. Spiritual blindness. I'd rather have a man on each side of me leading me physically blind than to be spiritual blind. Now, when we were raised down in the mountains in Kentucky where I was born, we had a little old clapboard shingles and Mama used to take us to the night and us little kids and we slept on a straw tick with a feather bed over the top of us and it didn't have quilts and it just lay a piece of canvas over so the snow it fell through the night, wouldn't get in our little faces. There was about five of the little Branhams at that time. 
And they'd pile us all in the bed, some in the foot and some in the head. We only had the one. And the cold breeze going through the cracks of the house would put cold in our eyes. And in the morning when Mama would come to get us, sometimes she'd have to pick us up and it, we got what we call in the South matter in our eyes. Pus, I think, would be the right name. Something. Cold. And it would matter in our eyes through the night and stick our eyes and we couldn't see. And now Grandpa hunted coons. And when he catched coons, he'd take the fat off of it and render the grease out and make what they call coon grease. It was a good cure for anything for a Kentuckian. And Mama used to take the coon grease when her eyes were all mattered up and she'd go get the coon grease and set it on the old stove and little old step, what we call monkey stove, and get the coon grease hot and come and grease our eyes with that till all this cold got out of our eyes. Then we could see. Brother, the church has been caught in a cold draft. <laughs> a bunch of theologians, not Danny, my brethren, but I'm responsible before God. I love my brethren. I love every church. But it's been caught in a draft between uh, modernism and uh, spiritual thermometer in the church has went 90 below zero. I dread to see these big old cold morgues. When you go into them, it reminds me of a morgue. You know, in a morgue, you take a dead man in there and bomb him to be sure that he don't come back to life again. Put more in him, more death in him than you had in him. And that's the way sometimes you do. Get in these morgues and they indoctrinate you with some kind of a theology that will keep you dead. Right. Be sure that you can't say amen. Be sure that you can't enjoy the Spirit of God. And they get you in there and they've got the church caught and these modern breezes of all the world and the things of the world and it's closed your eyes. And brother, it'll take more than coon grease to open them too. But Jesus said, I counsel of thee to buy of me fine gold tried in the fire and get some eye salve. The scripture said he had some eye salve. And put eye salve on your eyes and open up your eyes that you might be able to see. That's what we need tonight is some Holy Spirit oil to anoint the inside of our heart where we see from that we might be able to understand. God's got it here in the form of the Bible, but it takes a little fire to get it running right. Just like an engine on the track. We build the finest of engines. The nice plush seats get everybody in there and get ready to go and find out they have got no fire in the box. <laughs> engine won't roll. Can't even toot the whistle. <laughs> That's what's the matter at the church today. We need a, a real old-fashioned Pentecostal revival. A eye-opening time. The trouble of God sends gifts and things across the country, and we fail to see it. What do they say? What do they see? Oral Roberts on the television and the little sick children or little crippled maybe get healed in these meetings or A.A. A. Allen or, or any of the rest of the brothers. What do they say about that? They say it's a telepathy or, or psychology. They're only, only mentally worked up. A minister has the audacity of all the different actions produced thousands of statements by doctors and so forth of people who were laying dying with cancer, was crippled, was blind. How about Congressman Upshaw out here? Been in the wheelchair for 66 years and stood in Billy Graham's meeting on the White House steps and said, leaning on the everlasting arm. 
He was healed by God in my meeting that night in California, a square away from me nearly when I seen him and called who he was and asked him to ride to the wheelchair for the first time. He'd been on his feet. He was 80-something years old since he was 17. And he ran to the platform touching his home. Congressman William D. Upshaw run for president in 26 and was defeated because he was on the dry ticket. And I said, sir, I don't know who you are, but you fell on a, off of an old haystack and hit a hay frame. You've been crippled since you was a little boy. He said, that's right. I said, I see you bore, they bore the holes in the house so that your bed would, it, walking on the floor vibrating would hurt your back. That's right. And I said, you become a great man. He was the president of the Southern Baptist Convention. And I said, then you become a great speaker. And you're from the White House. Mr. Baxter run extension, Mike Baxter, to see who it was. He run back up to me and said, that's, you know who that is? He said, that's Congressman Upshaw. I said, never heard of him in my life. I don't know him about politics. So he said, uh, he said, he said, he won't talk to you through this mic. He said, my boy, how did you know that I was in that shape? I said, sir, I only can say what I'm looking at. And about then I looked over here. I seen a doctor with tortoise shell glasses on. One of the doctors coat operating on a little colored girl in a paralyzer. I said, I see a man standing before me with tortoise shell glasses. He's a doctor. He's operating on a little colored girl about four years old and it's paralyzed her. And about that time, about three times the distance of this building, a typical old Aunt Jemima, that big black fat cheek, let out a scream and she had a stretcher and here she comes. That was my baby, she said. You couldn't keep her away. Sixteen ushers couldn't stop her. She was just knocking them right and left. And big fat arms are going. And I said, now stop, lady. I said, have you a prayer card? She said, no, sir. I don't have no prayer card. She said, I'll just come in here. But that's the doctor man that operated on my baby two years ago. I looked out at the baby. The intern or the man with the hand was, was there. I said, that's the baby. She said, will my baby get well? I said, Auntie, I don't know. The only thing I can do is say what I see. She said, I said, I just pray, God, somehow your faith touched him. i never seen you. And the old congressman said, sir, will I get well? I said, I can't tell you, sir, I don't know. I only can say what I see. If God's that close to you, surely he has a purpose of it. I said to my brother, bring the next patient. And there's a woman coming up. And as I did, I looked, and there was this little colored girl going down a street or an alley with a little doll in her arm, rocking the doll. That is, there wasn't enough demons out of hell to have stopped it then. God had done said so. I said, Auntie, the Lord God has heard your prayer and your little baby's healed. She's down on her knees just crying and attracting attention. And I said, your little girl is healed. She said, oh, Parson, well, Parson is a minister down south. And he said, will, will my baby live? I said, it's healed right now. By that time, the little girl raised up and said, looky here, Mama. And she jumped up on their feet and went and fainting around like that. And we made them all keep quiet. And the mother taking the little girl by the hand and walked down a long aisle down through that long place like that. And the, uh, uh, the undertaker taking the stretcher and went back the other way. Started to turn to the, the little girl, uh, to the lady who was standing there. I looked on across the platform in front of me, and there went that old man with a striped suit on, two-tone brown striped suit, a little hat like you see laying there. He's the one that gives them to me. And he's going across the, uh, across the platform like a shadow, tipping his hat to everybody, that southern way of doing it like that as he bounced. I said, Congressman, he had on a blue suit and a red tie. You politicians know that was his way of dressing. And I said, it looks like that God would have healed you back there when you were 17 years old. When your bones is all, uh, had a lot of calcium, but wait here till you're 84 before he heals you? He said, my son, do you mean that God will heal me? I said, sir, have you got a, a brown suit, dark brown with a light stripe in it? that said, just bought one yesterday. I said, you wear a little semi-western hat, don't you? He said, yes, sir, I do. I said, in the name of the Lord Jesus, come up from that wheelchair and come here and he said, you mean I can get up? His wife run down to his seat like that. said, oh, honey, you'll fall. He said, if that man could tell me, he said, Dr. Roy Davis, our angel in the Baptist church, sent me. I said, yes, and he is the one sent me here. He said, if God has let you know how I was hurt 
Yeah, I can get out of this chair. And out of there he went and run to the platform and touched his toes and just as nimble as a 16-year-old boy. Congress and up, y'all. At Billy Graham's meeting in Washington, D.C., stood on the steps and sank, leaning on the everlasting arm and what? Blind! Hold oh, that miserable thing. Blind! That ought to shock the world. Why is it they're blind and don't know it? Self-righteous with a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. The Bible said it would be in the last days. Blind. Oh, God tonight. I pray thee, Lord. Bring out that. Open the eyes of the people that they can see that Jesus still lives and reigns. And his ominous presence is here. You people have seen so much so it's become common to you. That's what's the trouble. One time an old man said, I believe I'll go down to the sea to see the beauty. I've never seen the sea. And he said, I want to smell its air, that salt breeze. I want to hear the gulls as they scream through the skies and see the great briny waves as it leaps up to reflect the sky, the blueness back into the salt water. And on his road down, he met a sailor coming. And the sailor said to him, they called the sailor an old salt, and he said, where do you go, my good man? He said, oh, kind sir, I see that you're a man from the sea. He said, I'm going down to the sea. I'm longing to be inspired of its beauty. I long to see its big white waves dash. I've never seen them. I've only seen pictures. I long to smell the breeze of the salt. I long to hear the roar by the seaside. And the sailor said, I don't see nothing thrilling about it. I was born on the sea. You see, it had become so common to me till there was no more thrill left in it. And I'm afraid America has seen so many things and turned their back. There's no more thrill to it. And I'm talking now to you Pentecostal and full gospel people. You've seen the Lord God manifest himself and do the things that he said he would do until it's become so common there's no more thrill to it. God shake us tonight. God's so good to you people. And you people who are full gospel and believe all the Bible. God's done so many miracles and done so many things for you. He's been so good, but you don't recognize it. Wake up. Open your eyes. He's standing knocking. Trying to get in. To control you. To make you what you should be. To take away the world from you. And to make you new creatures of His. That's why He gives you the things that He's given you. Way down in the south one time there was an old Negro man. And he was a nice old fella, but he just wouldn't get straightened out with God. And his pastor, a friend of mine, loved to hunt. I used to hunt with the old pastor. And old Gabe, we called him, his name was Gabriel. But he just wouldn't serve the Lord. And he had a good wife. And she prayed for old Gabe day and night. The pastor talked to him, preached sermons and everything. And old Gabe just hang away from church and go down and shoot craps on Sunday morning and go fishing or something. He just wouldn't get right with God, yet he claimed he was a member of the Baptist church. One day him and the pastor had been hunting. And old Gabe couldn't hit the side of a barn. He just, he just, the bird would fly up this way and not shoot anyway. He just couldn't hit nothing. So that day they both had a great field day and they were just loaded down with squirrels and rabbits and fine eating birds and so forth. And old Gabe had such a load, he could hardly pack, tripping along behind the old pastor. They're coming along an old familiar pathway. And the sun was going down in the west. 
And brother, sister, if there ever was a sunset now on civilization, it's now. And after a while, as the pastor made his way along this familiar path, this certain path, he felt something touch him on the shoulder. He looked around, and old gates, the tears were rolling down his black cheeks. He said, Parson, in the morning is Sunday. He said, yes, Gabe, what's the matter? He stopped, turned around. He said, in the morning, I was trying to come down to your church. I was going to be baptized. I was going to the altar's bench. I was going to make myself right before God. I was going to get myself a seat. There I'm going to be every service until God takes my soul to home. And the old faithful colored pastor said, Gabe, you know it. I'm, I'm happy for that. He said, I, I, I've been trying and your whole wife's going to be so happy and all the church is going to be so happy. He said, and all your associates will be happy too, Gabe. But said, just what sermon did I preach, Gabe? Or what time did I pray for you that causes sudden change? I'd like to know what caused it. He turned and looked back towards the sun again. He said, Pastor, I sure appreciate every prayer that you all prayed and, and every sermon that you preached. But you know, I just happen to recognize how good he is to me. He said, Pastor, you know, I couldn't hit nothing. But I do good to get a two or three birds a year. And said, here I'm just loaded down with game. He said, Pastor, you know, he must love me or he wouldn't have given it to me. So that's right, Gabe. I just wonder tonight if we, as American people, I wonder if, it's great to even be alive. But don't you realize that he must love you or he wouldn't give you these revivals? Don't you realize he must love you or he wouldn't send his son to manifest his presence, his being? Don't you know he must love you or he wouldn't save you? He wouldn't heal you, he wouldn't send you to his meeting. He stands at the door and not daily with all kinds of good things and we constantly turn them away. Let us bow our heads this morning. That you're a privileged person to live in this day. Great man, Sankey's Moody's, Knox, Calvin, Finn. All of them has longed to see this day that when Jesus would come and do the works that he did once. Prophets and great men have looked for this day and you look at it what you've called a spiritual cold and your eyes have been closed. Such a person here, would you raise your hand in the last of this revival now? Let me just take full possession in my life. Will you raise your hand? Church member, whoever God bless you, that's right. All around. I'll let you in, Lord. I promise that you can be my Lord. You can govern my life. You can have all the folly of my life. Take it out, Lord. Just come in. I want you to be here in my heart. I want you to control me. Control my emotions. Control my habits. Control my pride. Oh, I think I'm somebody, Lord. I can get out here on the street and twist up and down the street. Take it away, Lord! Just raise your hand, Jay, now. Why you got to have God bless you. That's good. I like to see those young folks being there. Young girls. Up in the balcony. God bless you. Balcony to the rear. Just raise your hand, Paul. If you really need it, call it. Of course, if you're blind, it's a too bad. Balcony to the right. God bless you. That's good. Young man. You might have done many great things, but that's the greatest thing you've ever done. Great number of hands you've been up. 
Is there just some more before we pray? I want to pray for you. Say, Brother, in a few moments we'll determine what's going to take place. I have spoke of these, for this is 28 years since the boy, claiming you're the same yesterday, today, and forever, that you do not change. The Bible says that you remain the same, that you're not dead, the grave could not hold you. You rose on the third day, on the first Easter morning, proving yourself alive before the people and commission them to go into all the world, and you'd be with them to the end of the world. And you said, The things that I do shall you also. And you said, I do nothing in myself until I see the Father do it first. Then I do what the Father shows me to do. And we'll follow you through the Scriptures and see that every instant it was what the Father showed you to do. The people touched your garments, and by the power of God you turned them around and told them what was wrong in their condition. We thank you, Lord. You promised to continue that you was the vine and we'd be the branch. Lord, the vine doesn't bear fruit, it's the branch. So move to us tonight, Lord. Every one of us, I realize, if you would anoint one person in here and not the rest, it would do little good. Lord, anoint all of us. All of us. Open our eyes, Lord that we can see that you are risen from the dead. And here in the form of the Holy Ghost, not another person, but the same person, God in the form of the Holy Ghost, called God the Holy Ghost. O oh, Father, grant that this be so. You came and dwelt in a human body once, your Son, a pure, virgin-born body, that you might through that holy blood break the cell to offer to the worshiper now an access to you. And through that broken cell of blood, we're cleansed from our uncleansedness and make a vessel for the Master's use. Through grace are we saved. And, uh, Father, we pray now that you'll look down upon us and forgive us and open our eyes that we might see your resurrected being, that we might leave from here tonight knowing this, that every stone that could be turned, we have did it. To see an old fashioned revival in the New England states among these wonderful people of yours. In Jesus' name, I offer this service to you. Amen. Now we start tonight, and I want everyone just as reverent, no matter what your condition is, what troubles you have, just believe. Pray. Believe. Vision does not heal you. You can't be healed by vision. First, I want to ask you something. How many know in this, body, in this group of people that Christ did not heal anybody until the Father of God showed him a vision on what to do? How many know the scripture says that? That's 100%. Then when he was on earth, how he declared himself to be the Son of God to the Jewish race. Don't never forget that. How did he do to declare himself to be the Son of God to the Jewish race? A man came to him immediately after he was anointed with the Holy Ghost, St. John, the first chapter. And he was a fisherman, ignorant and unlearned, could not even sign his own name. And as soon as his brother brought him in the presence of the Lord Jesus, Jesus said to him, Your name is uh, Simon, and your father's name is Jonas. From henceforth you shall be called Simon. How many know that's the scripture? What did that man think? How did he know him? That was his way of declaring himself. For he had said, I do nothing now until I see the Father do it first. St. John 5, 19. Nothing. He could not lie and be God. He had to tell the truth. So he said, I do nothing until the Father shows me first. Then we see another man got converted the next day. And he went way around the mountain, 15 miles, and he found a real stock church member under a tree praying, good man. And he brought him back and said, come see who we found, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. He said, could any good thing come out of Nazareth? See, because it wasn't affiliated with his church, he wouldn't believe it. He said, come see. That's the best way. Don't sit at home and criticize. Just come look for yourself. Examine it with the scripture. And so when he came and along... No doubt the Philip had told him what Jesus had did. 
for that old fisherman that couldn't even sign a ticket for his fish. And when he got in front of Jesus, the first time Jesus ever seen the man, he said, Behold an Israelite in whom there's no God. And not by his dress, they all dressed alike. How a, a Israelite, that meant that he was a, we say a believer, no God, a pure, honest, holy man. Behold an Israelite in whom there's no God. He said, Rabbi, when did you ever know me? He said, Before Philip called you, I saw you when you were under the tree. Is that right? How did he see him 15 miles away the day before under a tree? What I? Her father had chosen. And he said, Rabbi, you're the Son of God. You're the King of Israel. Jesus said, Because I told you that, you believe. Then you'll see greater than this. But there was those who stood by said, That man is, has a devil spirit. He's reading their minds. He's a fortune teller. Jesus said, I'll forgive you for that. But in so many words, someday the Holy Ghost will come to the Gentile people. And he'll do the same thing that I'm doing. And one word against it will never be forgiven in this world or the world to come. On he went. That was the Jews. Now remember, he never did that before any Gentile in the entire Bible. That's where he declared himself to be the Son of God. See, he had never dealt with the Gentiles before. So he went one day by the Samaritans and a beautiful young woman come out to the well to get a drink. Everybody was gone. Away from the well with Jesus. And so when the woman come there, she seen him, and she started to let the pot down to get the water, and she said, bring me a drink, woman. She said, well, we got segregation here. It's not customary for you to use that Samaritan. She said, I'm a woman of Samaria. She said, but if you knew who you were talking to, you would ask me for a drink. They went to talking about where they should worship at. So Jesus found where her trouble was. Does anybody know what her trouble was? She had been married five times. Six times. So Jesus said, go get your husband and come here. She said, I don't have any husband. He said, that's right, you've had five. And the one you're living with now is not your husband. Now what did she say? Did she say, you're an evil spirit doing that? She turned and she said, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Who was that prophet? Moses said, the Lord your God will rise up a prophet. See? She said, for sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. We, we Samaritans, we know when the Messiah cometh, which is called the Christ. When he comes, he'll tell us these things. But who are you? He said, I'm he that speaks to you. She ran into the city and said, Come see a man who told me the things that I've done. Isn't this the Messiah? If that was the sign of the Messiah then, to the Jew and the Samaritan, Ham, Shane, and Jephthah's people is all left. Jew, Gentile, and Samaritan. And now we've had 2,000 years of church. God's called the Gentile bride out down through the Finney and the Sinking and so forth. The age. Now we're at the end of the Gentile age, at the end of time. As I spoke of last night, at any time something can happen. The world's nervous. You hear the president's speech yesterday. Well, we just don't know what's going to happen. It could happen before morning. But it's in the skies, as Jesus said there would be in everything. The whole world shaking, man dying with heart failure, perplexed at times, distressed between the nations. And in that day, he promised to return. And do as he did then. A little while, and the world won't see me no more, yet you'll see me, for I'll be with you. The works that I do, you shall do also. Now, he can't declare himself to the Jews and to the Samaritans in that manner and leave the Gentiles out. So this is the day. Now to you out there, just before we start praying. There was a woman one time that he didn't have a vision for until she come and touched his garment. She had a blood issue. She ran off out in the audience because she said in her heart, I believe that that man's a holy man. And if I can touch him, I'll be healed. The doctors had failed for many years, 18 years about So she ran out into the audience after touching Jesus. stopped and said, Who touched me? And Peter said, Well, all of us touching you. He said, but I got weak virtues gone from me. And he looked around over the audience until he found the little woman. And he told her her trouble and that her faith had made her well. You know that's the Bible? Does the Bible say that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever? Does the scripture say that he's a high priest right now that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmities? If he is a high priest and can be touched by the feeling of our infirmities, and the same high priest, the same Jesus, would he not act in the same way? 
So you pray, you without cards. It won't be on the platform or with cards, wherever you are. Just pray and look this way. And you say, Lord Jesus, I'm sick. I won't be up there on the platform. And confirm your words to me tonight. Touch my body and let me know while we know the Spirit's here and your Spirit's telling me to believe you and your Spirit is all Brother Branham. Let him turn and say to me, like he did the woman at the well, I believe you. Like he did the woman touched his garment, I believe you. See if he's the high priest. Now, please don't move around for the next few minutes. This will tell whether God is alive. If this isn't true, then his word isn't true. If this is true, every word is true. How do you do this? Now, quickly, this man here, I've never seen him, don't know him. And if, if that's right, that we are strangers to each other, raise up your hand. I don't know you've never seen me. This is our first meeting time. And then it would be just like our Lord who found Philip who came and got Nathaniel and brought him to him. Now, if I say, you're sick, lay hands on you, go be well, you could doubt that. But if the Lord God will reveal to me what you're here for, or do something like he did in the Bible, then he, he's here. See? It wouldn't be me because I don't know you. I don't know a person in this building outside of Brother Lord Sweet, Dr. Vale. Billy was here. My boy, I guess he's gone. But these two men standing here. This singer sitting right here, I don't know his name, but he's been with us in the former campaign. As far as I'm not, uh, every person that I know in the building. But God knows all of us. If the Lord God will do this, it has to be a miracle. Because there's no way in the world I, I can know it. Here's my hand, my Bible. I don't believe in swearing, but I've never seen that man in my life. First time we've ever met, to my knowledge, of anything. And this about truth of knowing you all, you be the witness of that. I don't know. But God who does know, if he will reveal to me something that you know that I don't know, to be anything about you, then you'd have a right to believe, wouldn't you? How many in the audience would accept it? Thank you. Now, Father, it's up to you. This is your service. I'm waiting for you. Amen. Say, what are you waiting for? You've seen the picture of this pillar of fire that led the children of Israel. When it was here on earth, when it was in the burning bush, it was Christ. All by the teachers know that. When he was here on earth, he said, I was a, for Abraham was I am. The I am was in the burning bush. He said, I came from God, I go to God. He come in from a pillar of fire, was made flesh and dwelt among us in the form of God's Son, the Christ, died, buried, rose again, and the same pillar of fire returned back under the name of Jesus, the Holy Ghost. On the road down to Damascus, Paul was struck down. A light set him in the face. He said, Saul, why persecuted thou me? He said, Who are you, Lord? He said, I'm Jesus. Is that scripture? Well, then, if this is the same Holy Spirit that was in that day, the same Jesus, would not the same vine bear the same fruit? If it's the same vine, I'll be with you, in you. Now, God, open our eyes that we can see. Now, if they can still hear my voice, between me and the man comes that light. I see the man. What he wants me to pray for, mainly, is the hearing, his ears going deaf. That's the truth. See, he can still answer me. And ever since he's been standing there, he's been hearing better all the time. That's right. Raise your hand if that's right. See, he's just in the presence of Christ. Not me now. This. He said you guessed it, Brother Brandon. 
Let the Lord be judged. There had to be something to cause that. That was caused from a condition in your nose. A nose trouble made you going dead. You believe me to be his servant? You believe that his spirit is here now? Your name is Mr. Neelan. Return home, you have your hearing. God has rewarded you. No need of praying for him. His faith made him whole. We are strangers to each other, sir. Years apart were we born, perhaps miles apart in our first time meeting. I'll be real, Reverend. We're surely my dear beloved friends. I have no way of doing those things. Is your eyes open to realize that the Lord Jesus, the same Spirit, is here? My father would have lived, he'd probably been your age. Oh, I'd give all if I had millions of dollars to see my daddy stand there like that now. But he's gone on now to glory. I shall follow someday. I'm only here to try to help. You are a Christian, sir. You're a Christian. You could have been an infidel or an imposter, but you're a Christian because your spirit is coming into this anointing of the angel of the Lord. And you're aware that something's going on. If that's right, raise up your hand so the people see. The Lord God is so good. I do not know you and know nothing of you, but right now the anointing of the Holy Spirit can reveal to me what your trouble is or something about you. And the man is suffering from also a ear condition. It's in his ear. And then you've got a tumor in your neck. That's right. You're not from this city. You're not from this nation. You come from the east this way. You're from New Brunswick, Canada. Mm -hmm. Your name, you believe God could tell me who you are like you know, Peter? Would it help you? All right, sir. Your name is George Robinson. Amen. That is true, isn't it? Be, you're healed, sir. You won't have to have your operation. God has healed you. come? Reverend, you come? Sister, dear, which you are my sister, you're a Christian, or as soon as I look at you, there's the Spirit of the Lord. And this is a beautiful picture of the Bible of St. John 4, a man and woman that met for the first time as a woman at a well. Jesus told her what her trouble was, and she said, that's the sign of the Messiah. Would it be the same to you? It would be. You are suffering from a tremendous nervous condition, and that nervous condition has given you a stomach trouble. You have stomach trouble. It's a peptic condition, ulcerated like right? because when you eat or drink something like coffee, sensitive gets in your mouth and so forth. And then you've got something on your heart that you're praying for. See, your life, you couldn't hide it now if you had to. See, you're in the presence of Christ, not me. Christ. You're praying for somebody else. That person's death. That's right. That's your son. You believe he's going to be healed? Then go and receive it. If you have believed, so be it unto you. God bless you, my friend. How do you do? We are strangers to each other. I've never seen you in my life. I'll be real reverent. There's a woman praying, she's elderly, somewhere in this building. Here she is. She's sitting right here with a patch over her eye. I do not know you, lady. God does know you. If I do not know you, wave your hand so that the people see it, I don't know you. But you were sitting there praying, Lord, touch me tonight. That's right. Your trouble 
You have been very, very sick. You have complications. And the main thing that's wrong with you is heart trouble. You've just come from a hospital, too. That's thus saith the Lord. <laughs> Don't fear. Your faith is healed. I want to ask somebody. Question the woman. Reporter, whoever you wish. See if I've ever seen her. What did she touch? She never touched me. She's 20 feet away from me at 30. What did she touch? The high priest. Right. This one who has this picture here. And through the Spirit, he speaks back. I just, I don't know what the woman, uh, what was the matter with her. I couldn't tell you. Only way I ever know these tapes here. It's a vision. She spoke to the woman sitting next to her then. And that woman's praying to, you believe me to be his servant, lady. You're praying for something too. Sitting next to her. If God will tell me what your trouble is, would you believe me? If I do not know you, raise up your hand. If you'll believe me with all your heart, that arthritis will leave you. That's what you were praying about, arthritis. If that's right, wave your hand. Now it's gone from you. Your faith has made you well. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. You're the lady I'm going to pray for next? I don't know you. But God does know you. If he'll tell me what you're here for, would you believe me to be his servant, believe in his spirit? I'm just a man. No way, first time we've ever met. Uh, pardon me. See, I have to just, wherever he, there's people out there believing, it's just hard to hold the line. So many believe in him. Here it is. You're suffering with the trouble of artery. Right? Besides that, you got bad eyes. Your sight's are failing you. You're extremely nervous. And that's right. You're not from here either. You're Canadian. Sorry. Miss Coughlin, that's who you are. Return home, your faith is you. Do you believe with all your heart? There's a spirit on the woman that's crossing the building. I cannot heal. I'm not a healer. I'm just the servant of the healer. But there's somebody in this building is praying, right now tremendously praying, or a group praying for somebody that's suffering with the same thing that you're suffering with. You're going blind at your eyes. <laughs> It's a girl sitting right back over here towards the back. And you're praying for a friend of yours that's going blind. I cannot heal. You believe God? Let us pray. Lord, this horrible spirit. But Lord, let the spiritual eye be open now to see the glory of God. May this demon of blindness be taken away. For I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I look at me again. It's different now, isn't it? Raise up your hand if it's different. You have your sight. Trusting you'll go and find it just the way you believe it with the others too. God bless you. Real I don't know you, sir. I'm getting awfully weak. Okay. Visions make me. If Jesus, the Son of God, one woman touched him, he said, I got weak. 
have our inner sinners saved by grace. It would never happen if, if it wasn't. He said, more than this shall you do. I've never seen you, sir. We're both eternity bound people. If I could help you, I'd do it. If Christ was here with my with these clothes that He gave me, He could. If you're sick, I don't know if you're needing healing. You might be for someone else. I don't know. But if, if He was here with these clothes on, He couldn't heal you if you are sick. He could tell you He did it and do something like He did and let you know that it was Him. That's right. You're suffering with your back. You're not from here. You're a Canadian too. You're a preacher too. Go on. You're a That that's the only other rule for rheumatism. You believe that God will make you well, lady? Sitting right back there, about two rows back. On the end of the road, three. Rheumatism. You believe with all your heart? Do you believe it? Got a little flowers around the top of the hat. Little lady saying, You believe and accept it? All right. Raise up your hand. Then. All right. Go home and be well. Jesus Christ, make you well. I challenge you to believe the truth. How about you in the audience? Can you believe? Here it is, right here with this lady. Right there. Suffer with a lady's trouble, female trouble. Little lady with a little white hat on. That's right. You believe Jesus Christ will make you well? I don't know you, do I? But you're having a drainage from that. I see it's the bathroom. What it is, is an abscess on your ovary, which could go to cancer. But it won't. Your faith has healed you. Go home. You're well. Your faith touched God. Do you believe? Sitting right here on the end, lady and man, got your arms around her, it's your wife. That's one of you is nervous, the other is heart trouble. That's right. You accept your healing? Raise up your hands if you do. God bless you. Go home and be well. There's many out there suffering as your trouble, lady. But diabetes is nothing for God to heal. You believe He can heal that? With all your heart? All that's suffering with diabetes, raise up to your feet right now. Raise up to your feet. Come on, right here. All over the world. I will show you what God can do. Just stand on your feet a minute. Stand right back here. Just a minute. All that's suffering with nervousness, can stand up on your feet just a minute. It's the pulling so hard from the audience. I could look at your seat. Every one of you is bleeding. How? See, how could I say this and that and this and that? It's just everywhere, see? All of you that's once there and you believe that God is going to heal you, stand up on your feet. Do you believe that Christ lives? Do you believe that He is the same? Is your eyes open now to see? How many say, God, my eyes are open? Raise up your hands like this, please. My eyes are open, Lord. I believe that the Son of God is with us. Now, while you pray in your way, I'm going to ask God to make all the doubt leave the building. I want every one of you to rise to your feet and give him thanks, and I'll pronounce you healed in the name of Jesus Christ if you'll obey. Lord God, the creator of heavens and earth, the author of everlasting life, and the giver of every good gift, send thy blessings upon this people. Satan, all through education and through the systems of the world, You've blinded the people for years, but you're exposed. We do not accept you. We claim that you were defeated at Calvary when Christ died and rose again, and you were stripped of every power that you had. You have no power left. You're just a bluff, and we're calling your bluff in the name of Jesus Christ by the authority of the angel of God who has charged us to this meeting. Come out of the people. All of you spirits of diseases and leave the people alone in the name of Jesus Christ. Stand up on your feet now and give praise to God. I pronounce you healed in the name of Jesus Christ.